In our final session that stands between you and lunch, always a dangerous spot, uh, I'm very pleased to say that we're going to be quite agile. Um, I'm going to bring out my panelists to talk to us about the agile economy. And it's a CEO panel, so we've got some, uh, a couple of heavyweights as well as a heavyweight thinker. So let me welcome out um, Pat Gelsinger, CEO of VMware, uh, John Noseworthy, who is president and CEO of the Mayo Clinic, as well as Navi Raju, who's an uh, academic thinker and uh, author of uh, some excellent books, including co-author of Jagad Innovation. So give them a nice round of applause, please. please. Great. Now, why don't I um, start with you, Navi? Um, you've thought a lot about agility. Can you tell me, other than being a very attractive buzzword, what exactly does it mean to be an agile company? I think the other way to address that question would be to think about why one has to become agile. And uh, we always think about- Does anyone want to be slow and sluggish? That's right. But then the notion of time becomes very important because we always think about the most scarce resource being money or natural resources. But in today's hyper-competitive world, the most scarce resource happened to be time. So the idea of agility is essentially how do you essentially reduce the time it takes to create new products and services, but that's not just at the process level becoming agile. It's also important to make the organization itself more agile. And then most profoundly what I notice increasingly is that how do you create an agile mindset among your employees as well? So I think agility is ultimately about optimizing time, which is increasingly scarce, by focusing on making your processes agile as well as your organization's agile. But ultimately, we heard about the people dimension. It's also about making your employees more agile as well. Now, we, we heard a little bit of this from a previous panel. Uh, you'll remember Peter Diamandis from the XPRIZE was uh, talking about uh, when I pushed him on how do you actually get your employees uh, at Singularity University or any of his startups uh, to move quicker. He said, I put them in a smaller box, give them less time, push them. And so I guess there's a sense, that's a practicality of how Absolutely. you Absolutely, as, as a matter of fact, being in Silicon Valley, I mean, you guys all heard about the hackathon, right? Hackathon is a fantastic mechanism to create a sense of urgency, right? You have 48 hours at Facebook, right, to crank out the next big thing. So there's nothing like a pressure of, you know, compressing the most scarce resource, which is time. So that can work. And I can also make a counter argument about why some things need time. And obviously, none of us here says there's no scope for long-term projects. That's not the point. But this is a sense about sort of getting the metabolism higher at, in your organization. Absolutely. So I, I take your point. So in that frame, let me turn maybe to Pat. Um, now, you obviously run a software company. Uh, you guys are supposed to be agile anyway. You're not like a, it's not like you're bashing steel and making you know, tankers or cars. <laughs> You're supposed to have two guys in the garage and be disrupting yourself and eating your own lunch and all that. Um, and yet, at the same time, you're now a big company. Yep. Um, you, know, you also have uh, legacy assets. You have, you're fortunate enough to be a profitable company. And what we know is that when you have established businesses, revenue streams, profits, org charts, suddenly it becomes a lot harder to innovate. You know, all of history shows this. And so I want to hear from you, because again, this is the view from the top. And we'll, we'll, we'll turn to John next. Um, how do you nurture disruptive innovations, the breakthroughs within an organization when we know that oftentimes having existing assets, sales teams, marketing, distribution lines that are profitable almost guarantees that you know, they'll develop antibodies that will try to kill the new idea if it will threaten the existing line of business. Mm -hmm. uh, give us a uh, practical uh, advice. Yeah, a, a few thoughts in that respect. One is, you know, when we think about innovation, often we go to R&D. Right? Yeah. Innovation is everything you do. It might be how you support a customer. It might be how you deliver a product. And you have to create, and I think one of the unique roles of the CEO is the culture of the company. And you have to create a culture right, that defends and supports innovation and ready to you know, change things, disrupt things, eat your young anywhere throughout the company. You know, a lot of that, right, certainly from a software and R&D perspective, is you know, small little projects. And you have to you know, support, defend, and right, uh, uh, enable those projects to be going on, even though they may be disrupting right, the big engine that's profitable uh, today. And you know, from my Intel heritage, we had the Red X campaign. Right? That chip's done, time to bring the next one out, even though it's less profitable, less manufacturable. Right? You know, all of those types of things, you have to be ready to eat your young. Clearly, the, and I think you know, you, it needs to be bottom up, but it also needs to be top down. 
because in many regards, it's not a question of innovation, right? You've got lots of innovation going on. You've got lots of little projects going on. It's getting that innovation from the seedling, right, into some stage of maturity to be actively impacting the business or market. And that's where the CEO has to defend those trade-offs top down. You've got to say, guess what? I am taking 100 salespeople away from that core, right? And you are going to sell the existing product with 10% you know, less salespeople because we are going to invest in the terrible business decision because it's highly unprofitable of doing so, of getting this new thing off the ground. And it's going to take a couple of years till it becomes profitable. So you know, both is bottom up, has to be cultured, and has to be defended by the CEO. Um, now, you didn't say it explicitly, but it sounds like these uh, teams, which you are tasking with innovation, um, don't necessarily go through the traditional lines of command reporting to middle managers and, and other traditional functions. Um, may or may not. Uh, because if they did, they, those guys have their bonuses decided by how your traditional business works, right? So is there a way? How do you structure it? Dotted yeah. lines? How do you actually protect them or buffer them from being squashed? Um, and they may or may not be in the line of business. Typically, you have to have some sort of defense mechanisms where, hey, you know, I own the budget, you don't own the budget. You get to house the project for all these good scale reasons or infrastructure reasons or other things that it's best to put them inside of it. But they have to be defended some way because the nor all of the normal DNA mm -hmm. of the organization is optimizing. Right, you know, getting, you know, squeezing everything out to be more profitable. But that optimization function, of course, would, you know, be the rejection cells for any of those core innovations. So whether it's put them in a separate organization, often in the CTO organization, you know, defend their budgets by a separate budgeting and control uh, mechanism, right? And many of uh, my, you know, what we call our accelerate projects, you know, I personally review those on a quarterly basis. You know, they come into my office and I'm defending them top down and making sure, right, they're on track, getting the care and feeding they require. Um, let's see how some of this very excited and enthusiastic talk from a dynamic industry like software translates to healthcare, where um, uh, we have uh, uh, the law of the land that has been upheld now for a couple of years. I think the anniversary of Obamacare just passed. Um, is uh, the new healthcare law, is it the bane of innovation, or is it a boon to innovation from your perspective? Well, thanks, CJ. Um, Mayo Clinic's in its third century now, so we've been a very innovative company. You're you older will. even than The Economist, which is uh, 175 <laughs> years old. Um, and the fact that we're still thriving, I think, suggests that innovation is a big part of what we do. Hmm. Perhaps one of the greatest innovations was in 1904 when the Mayo brothers said, we need a single medical record for all of our patients in order to integrate our care. So all the doctors and nurses would be on that single page. Mm -hmm. And we're still catching up with that in the rest <laughs> of our profession. But there are three huge imperatives. The first one you mentioned, and in the, in the preface, you talked about seismic turbulence. Mm -hmm. But with the economy and the cost of healthcare at 18% of the world's largest economy, and now adding another 10% of the population to the uh, unsustainable Medicare trust fund, if you will, uh, and no way to pay for it, and indeed taking payments out of that, and indeed now with sequestration, defunding innovation, if you will, the NIH and National Science Foundation and so on, it doesn't sound like it's a great time to be innovative. But for all the reasons that all the experts have talked about today, this is the perfect time for innovation. And we've basically identified two huge imperatives. The first one, which I just mentioned, was uh, how we're going to pay for this. And that's not completely in our control in healthcare. As you know, someone else decides how we get paid. But the two that are within our control is how do we develop a system where Americans can have uh, integrated healthcare, much like we have at the Mayo Clinic. Mm -hmm. That's a huge opportunity. We believe that's our most scalable opportunity at the Mayo Clinic to help the country. And the second is this evasive notion of how do we pay for value? How do we motivate? the system to have the best outcome at the lowest cost. And we have two, I think, we'll see what the Google people think, but two epic level innovations to address those. Give us a small taste briefly of one of them. First one, uh, second, I'll do the second, second one. I'll do them both fast. <laughs> Basically, Mayo's taken all of everything we know, yeah. not only what we know, but how we work, and digitized it. And basically have said, through our affiliate network, this is how Mayo works. This will help you provide integrated care locally. We think that's better than a consolidated strategy where you do R&D all over the place. The second one, which we announced a couple of months ago, was basically saying, how do you get at cost and quality? And in a research strategic alliance with the United Health Group, the largest insurance company in the world, 
through their Optum Labs, take Mayo's outcome data, mm -hmm. all de-identified, take 109 million lives of claims data, the cost, put those together, create an open innovation forum for academics, policymakers, and the private sector, put our data in and analyze big data and drive outcomes. This, we, we've been told by others, really changes everything. Navi, will you come and weigh in, particularly picking up on the point about open innovation? Mm -hmm. uh, where do you see this going? Yeah, I think open innovation is a great way to actually uh, save on time because if you look at Procter & Gamble, uh, it's very fascinating because one of the big projects they're embarking upon right now is around frugal innovation. So the way they define frugal innovation is doing what they're doing today at one third of the cost, mm -hmm. one third of the time, and one third of the efforts. So this is fascinating because what they realize is that Yes, open innovation for the last 10 years allowed them to open up and embrace external talent and ideas, but now the pressure is not to get ideas quickly inside, but convert them very quickly into products and services. So they are focusing a lot on creating uh, you know, an accelerated pipeline for converting these ideas into branded products and services. So I think, I believe that open innovation is gonna be useful not only on the inbound side of the innovation pipeline, but increasingly as a way to convert them into products and services as well. So especially with things like a 3D manufacturing, et cetera, my feeling is that increasingly we'll see that uh, every aspect of the value chain potentially can be you know, uh, submitted to an open innovation kind of you know, paradigm. In which case, I think that companies can experience dramatic gains in terms of the go-to market. Because as you defined very well, Vijay, innovation is not inventiveness. It's about creating value out of fresh ideas. So I see actually that, that the open innovation paradigm focusing the next decade around the notion of frugal innovation, which is how do you save time in converting these ideas into value? The, um, I want to come to questions in just a little bit. So uh, please get your thoughts together in the audience. The, um, uh, I want to come back to you, um, John, if you don't mind. Uh, you know, you're, uh, despite having uh, uh, the handicap of legacy assets and history and age, um, you're widely recognized as having, uh, uh, being one of the most innovative organizations in healthcare in the US and the world and having great outcomes. I mean, the published literature shows. Yeah. And in part, I think it's fair to say that in an American healthcare system uh, larded with uh, perverse incentives uh, in which piecework is rewarded rather than uh, value creation, that is better patient outcomes, for example, um, you have an integrated approach. Uh, and so, I mean, hats off to you for that. You. Um, but the question I have and a challenge for you, if I'm not mistaken, I think um, uh, you have tried to expand beyond your base in mm -hmm. middle, Amer middle America to, is it Arizona and Florida mm -hmm. that you tried? Mm -hmm. And the reports I read about that was that it wasn't that easy, that uh, you found it even you yourselves, yes. that is you and your predecessors, yes. uh, with your own systems and all the in-house knowledge and culture, yes. um, couldn't clone yourself perfectly. Yes. And so what hope is there for the rest of us if even you yourself couldn't replicate the Mayo Clinic? Well, thank you. Uh, it's taken 25 years. I think we're there now. I think any of you who've been to those sites would see that it feels like the Mayo Clinic. And that's why we've taken a different strategy from the consolidation strategy that some of our, if you will, competitors are doing. Because we realize putting the name of Mayo Clinic on a hospital does nothing to the culture. Mm -hmm. And culture is really, really tough. And so what we've decided to do rather is focus on the integration of the care, if you will, Mayo Clinic inside. How do we care for patients? And then allow the doctors and nurses there. If that doesn't help them, they can cont contact us directly. Because the brand is important and it's hard to change the culture. That said, that's also a potential barrier for us that has such a strong culture. How do we innovate quickly? Mm -hmm. Because medicine is both innovative, as you've all heard, but also traditional. It's very personal. I want time with my doctor. That's the way I want my care. I don't want it on a cell phone or something of that nature. And so essentially what we've said to our staff, all 60,000, is we're not gonna change who we are, which is patient-centered at humanitarian not-for-profit organization, but we're gonna change how we work. And every one of you, like we heard this morning, we're gonna release your creativity to find new ways, whether it's cheap and fast and, 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 and frugal, uh, or whether it's high tech. To, to change that, to drive out waste and drive up our quality. So it's, it's, a, it's a great challenge. That's a great tee up, actually. We have a, a short video from Vimeo on how to scale your company without losing its identity that might help spark some questions from the floor. So why don't I um, ask for the video to be played? Thank you. Hi, I'm Kerry Trainer. I'm the CEO of Vimeo. One of my own personal challenges is, you know, how do you grow a product that has fantastic business potential um, 
but do it in a way that doesn't destroy what made it special in the first place. How do you maintain the spirit of moving quickly and making decisions quickly, even as you're adding new functions to the organization and frankly, just a lot more people into the room? So more questions and answers from our friend on the video, but that's meant to spark your uh, questions from the floor. I see immediately a hand went up in the back row. Let's get a microphone there. And again, please uh, wave your arms and make yourself known because it's quite, quite hard to see you. Um, Jay, we don't have glasses. I mean, uh... yeah, exactly. I need Google glasses to be able to see. All right, why don't we start okay. back there? Again, please, Sh short sure, and sure. sweet. Very uh, short. And, uh, and identify yourself. Luis Solis of Imaginatic. How do you push down the responsibility for innovation to your next tier of leaders, managers, and below? beyond making it voluntary. OK. Does someone want to take this? Well, uh, I'll say first thing is I think part of the job of the leader of the organization is not to push it down, but to continue to own it and drive it you know, directly. And by doing so, you actually you know, are the proof point to the rest of the organization that they, too, can do that and replicate that into uh, their organization. So you know, innovation isn't something that can, quote, be delegated in that respect. Also, I think you all build it as you delegate it downward. Right, it's also to build it into the culture, right? To really continue to applaud the successful innovations, right? Recognize the failures, learn from them, and make it okay to fail, and uh, really continue to reinforce culturally so that innovation emerges from all sorts of interesting places that none of you could manage or predict. We build it into our top of the house strategy for leadership and organizational development. It's an expectation, but you, as, as we heard, you don't want to shut it out at the grassroots level. So it's, it's both. OK. Um, let's see. We have uh, another hand here. Hello. Uh, Dean Economy, National ICT Australia again. Uh, first of all, thanks to the Mayo Clinic for all the fantastic information you put on the web. It's so clear and accurate. Uh, but a question maybe to Pat. Uh, I haven't heard anyone talk about uh, acquisitions as a way of getting innovation in, in larger companies. Um, it'd be great to hear your view on that. Yeah. Uh, I'll take the lead if others can add. but. Uh, you know, we've, uh, between EMC and VMware, our parent company, we've acquired 80 uh, companies over the uh, last uh, decade or so and uh, are probably seen as the most successful of uh, any IT company right now in terms of acquiring and integrating those uh, acquired uh, companies. Uh, in terms of making it successful, one of the key things is, is that when you acquire a company, you have to keep the culture and objective of that company whole and what you're trying to get out of the acquisition. Most acquisitions fail because you actually try to grind it into the corporate culture that it is uh, being adopted by. And actually, you're destroying the very heart of innovation and the heart of the acquisition in the process of trying to integrate it. So rule one for us in any acquisition we do is do no harm, right? Do nothing to destroy the value on the other side. Right. Is, is that really true? Let, let me push you on this. Um, you know, I, I've been a, a reporter at The Economist for 20 years, and I've covered lots and lots and lots and lots of mergers, acquisitions, takeovers. Uh, and every serious study that's been done on them says, in every industry, most of them fail. Most of them fail <coughs> to produce the synergies uh, that are promised. Most of them fail to deliver the returns. In other words, this is a, a mugs game. And one of the lessons that I've taken away over the years um, and I would love to be educated on why your company is different, uh, is that uh, for, uh, in order to be nice, in order to spare egos, sometimes for uh, tax reasons, it is often said this is a merger of equals, we will respect your culture. In fact, typically there is an aggressor and there's a company that's in trouble or doesn't see a future and, and takes the, uh, is, is acquired. And those companies, for example, Exxon, when it took over mobile, all five senior uh, executives that were announced were all Exxon people. The company is Exxon. It wasn't a mobile um, a culture that was allowed mm -hmm. to flourish. And that was a hugely successful takeover at that time. And so I, I just I want to push back a little bit, because sure. there is some literature that suggests that, in fact, if you are such a big and successful company, maybe you should be like the Borg and assimilate mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, take the best out of the people you take in, but don't let them pretend that they're their own company. Yeah, and in many respects, I, and I'll say, you know, uh, there, there are many industries or many other things where that is an appropriate way, right, to deal. Because, you know, in that case, you're acquiring assets, you're acquiring oil fields, right? Hey, is that oil field different than this one? Does it have a different culture than that oil field? Well, of course not, right? It's the assets you're acquiring, that's what you're trying to optimize. In high tech and innovation, right, I believe that that is not the model, right, that will be successful where you do actually have to keep the culture right, and the unique aspects of that innovation entity. 
Now, again, if you're requiring something for a consolidation of two businesses to optimize market share, mm -hmm. you know, that's not an innovation acquisition. Right, that's not the thesis of what we're talking about today. If you're trying to acquire, you have to very carefully treat that thing that you're acquiring. And it's not a merger of equals. We're acquiring you, right? You're part of our company. But inside of that, how do we protect, support, and defend the core values, the business position that they were part of? And that, I think, is one of the key things that has made us more successful than most of our peers, right, in terms of high-tech acquisition for innovation. Now, again, that's just one source of innovation. Sure, what sure. you do organically, what you do with venture capital, what you do with uh, academic uh, research and how you partner. But this is an area that we have found great success in acquiring acquisitions uh, and uh, uh, have seen uh, that to be a source of sustained innovation for us as a okay. company. That's a great answer. Thank you for that um, and for putting up with <coughs> a rude question. You know, I think we've been neglectful, in my opinion, of this side of the room. Um, I see a hand here. Why don't I go here? It's awkward for the microphone to get you, sir, but we will um, make sure that it does. And again, uh, in, the, in the far back there, again, people, don't be shy. Jump up and down. Do uh, you know, whatever gestures you need to make to get my attention. Go ahead. Thank you. We, we've spoken a lot about- Please identify yourself. Uh, Bruce Goldberg from uh, Genentech. Uh, we've spoken a lot about preserving the culture, bringing the culture in. Can you guys go one level deeper and talk about what you actually do to do that? Is it Excellent. HR, comp-based? Is it- Friday beer parties, what is it? You know, what do you actually do beyond the kind of buzzword? Um, so at least in some of our cases, I was, uh, for instance, we just acquired a company uh, and uh, uh, I was meeting with them for the first time, 200 you know, fearful people sitting in the room in that first meeting with them. And they asked me if I was going to support their Friday beer parties. And I asked them, is that important to you? And their response was yes. And I said, I love Friday beer parties. Let's do it, baby. <laughs> And again, right, if it wasn't important, right, they asked me if I defended their dog policy. What's your dog policy? Well, we allow dogs in the workplace. Is that important to you? Yes, it is. Great. I love dogs in the workplace. Let's go for it. Right? So you know, it really is a question of what is important in those culture. What are you trying to get out of the acquired entity? Now, over time, these things got to normalize over two, three, four year period. But you know, that first six to 12 months is so critical. Right, you know, get over it, right? You know, who cares if they have Friday beer and the rest of the corporate policy doesn't support Friday beer? Get over it, right? And make sure that they're happy as part of the new entity and keep that culture of innovation, that business line alive as you go through that. You know, it's like adopting a new child, right? You gotta treat it very, very carefully. Uh, let's get another question. I see a gentleman right there actually close to where, where the previous question was. So how do you actually maintain that uh, secret of agility and being nimble? even when you actually acquire other companies and, they, and you try to maintain their own unique cultures because the conventional wisdom will say, well, streamline them, make them look the same so that they can move in the same direction. But how do you actually manage a multi-dimensional, multi-cultural kind of place, but still be nimble? Well, let's see, maybe Navi, do you want to Yeah, I mean, the company shot? that I was uh, dying to talk about, which is uh, Saatchi and Saatchi, a very famous advertising <laughs> agency. Yeah. When you think about advertising, you think it moves fast in terms of agility, but guess what? It moves fast, but they only know how to sell advertising in traditional channels like print and TV. But now there's an explosion of media, right? With social media, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. So they acquired a company called Duke. Uh, and uh, I went to visit the lab. Uh, it's actually in Paris, a uh, very fancy place. But what's interesting is that the culture itself is very evident in the way they organize the office. Completely open, uh, no boundaries, uh, no cubicles. And the whole paradigm is that Duke is basically a digital content and digital media company. So the idea is to bring in the DNA of folks in their 20s, you know, some, some of them actually even millennials and even uh, Gen Z sometimes. And, um, and what they allow them to do for Saatchi and Saatchi is to start and complete a campaign in 24 hours. In 24 hours, they can actually set up a campaign for a famous brand if they could. Well, a social uh, media campaign. Social media campaign. Right. But right. what's interesting is that uh, what they discovered is that some of the creative way of creating the content and the message, et cetera, has to rely on the traditional approach they have always used. But the platform now is very different. So what they're trying to do is not to say one is better than another is this is why leadership is very key, is to say like, you know, both approaches are relevant, but how do you fuse them and synergize them? And I think they've done a great job because they are one of the leading uh, ad agency right now in the world who can help brands both in the offline world and in the online world. Right, that's so. a good example. There's a question back there, um, a short question and a short answer. Yes, you started off by talking about- Please identify about yourself. 
Sorry, oh yes, I'm Janie Curtis. I'm the lead brand architect at a strategy and innovation group out of Denver. Um, you started off talking about how important time was as a resource, and yet earlier in the conference we heard about uh, how equally important it was to have a process for innovation, and yet, um, you know, my experience has been often within big organizations, these processes can actually play against innovation because they're very time consuming and can actually be idea sapping. How can you sort of marry those two things, the need to be agile and you know, do things in a, in a timely way? That's, a, that's a great question. Um, let, me, let me see, where John, you wanna jump in on this? Well, I'll jump in if I may. Uh, physicians are data-driven, physicians and scientists are data-driven, and one of the barriers we have is let's prove it to the seventh decimal point, if you will. And we have to fight that, of course, as we go through these innovations. I think the key, the way we've handled that, is to diffuse knowledge quickly. Once we've found something, if it works for colorectal surgery, it ought to work for others with less data and move it more quickly. But even though we don't do mergers and acquisitions, we have very different, if you will, uh, ecosystems within Mayo Clinic. One group is expected to turn out three new diagnostic tests every week, 150 tests a year. That's a very quick, rapid turnaround uh, cycle they learn from each other's. And other groups say, we've always done heart surgery this way. Why would we change? And we say, well, if you want resources, if you want another OR, you have to show us how you are going to change and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. So again, there's different ways of doing this. But I would say the process can kill anything. If you need to have a, 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 a definitive, uh, intentional process, get it right and then diffuse it quickly. And just maybe one point to quickly add. The process can demand short time. And one of the things sure. that we demand is uh, an early prototype, right? And you know, within you know, three months of the project being initiated, you have to show the first prototype working. And that enforces, right, you, know, you can't go on for these things long. You have to show something very quickly, and that's part of the process that you've put in place to make sure that you don't have big projects that go off the rails for long periods of time. Yeah. I think I would say that interesting in my book, Jugad Innovation, I kind of talk about how in emerging markets, people don't have a process. Uh, and the whole notion of process and systematization of innovation, I think my bold claim is that we have to move away from it because things are moving so fast. So case in point is Hire, a major Chinese appliance company that I profiled in my book. What they have done is that they have 60,000 employees and they completely laid off all the middle managers. Sorry to say that, but instead of having a pyramidal structure, they have a circle structure. So it's a collection of cross-functional teams that can sense and respond quickly to emerging needs. So in one instance, which is a famous example that you will laugh about, a very funny one, but uh, they discovered that there were some farmers in China who were using the washing machines to wash not only the clothes, but potatoes, right? Uh, this was picked up by a service technician. If you work for Whirlpool, your reaction would be like, look, that's a stupid thing to do. But because they work in these cross-functional teams, they didn't follow a process. They sense an opportunity, they said, what if there's a market for such a washing machine? Within two weeks or so, they came up with a washing machine that can wash both clothes and potatoes and became a bestseller today in China. Yeah. So I think that kind of organizational structure is equally important to get a thing in agility. So. Yeah, see, I, I love Navi as a guest because he knows how to make the right segue to lunch. A potato <laughs> washing machine. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And French with that, for lunch. I, I bring our <laughs> agile panel to a close quickly. Thank you very much. Give them a nice round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you.